Uh, we're in week two uh, of this month, as it were. I mean, that's obvious because it's week two of the month. Uh, but in terms of our sermon, uh, we're looking at James 2, 14 to 16. Uh, genuine faith is what, I better get my notes up, uh, is what we're looking at today. Um, so today we look at faith and deeds. Um, a common thing that's questioned by other people of Christians. Christians question other Christians about it. Do you follow up with action uh, in your faith? Do you believe that your faith is not just something uh, that is something you accept, but something you act on? Is it something that you actually do? And, and we'll be careful today to then not go the other way and making the works and the deeds something that you earn salvation with. And so we need to be careful. We're walking a line of grace as it were today, as we look into this message. And so what we see is that faith is more than just agreeing with God. Uh, faith is something that leads to action uh, that shows we're not just agreeing, but then also obeying. Uh, faith in Jesus influences our actions in our lives. And so we'll learn that rather than just being a witness to others of what we believe, uh, it is just as important for the believer themselves uh, as a faith health check uh, that we are living to that which we believe. What we'll learn is the difference between actions that come from faith and trust in Jesus and actions that look to earn God's favour in order to be saved and remain saved and that is called salvation by human effort which is a big no-no. Okay and we'll look at that today as well. Uh, I think it will help us probably to understand this difference, uh, this understand what James is talking about when he talks about deeds comes from faith. And I think there's probably a term cause and effect uh, you may have heard of, and it probably help it in this context to understand what he's talking about uh, and some understand what is genuine faith. Uh, so we'll start with an easy example, I think, to try and help explain it. Uh, think about your friends and your family uh, those you get on with, of course, and I say that because some people get on with their entire family, and I, I will admit, unfortunately, there is a lot of stuff in our family, in my parents' family, uh, that they don't necessarily get on anymore, and that's sad, but that does happen in a lot of families, um, but uh, think about families that part of your family, your friends' groups, that you, you have genuine love for, that you really want to see uh, be okay, be good in life. Um, and then when trouble comes, you want to help them in any way possible, uh, even in small ways. And you trust that they will then help you too, when you too are in trouble, when the going gets tough. Uh, and they show that by actually doing it. So. Uh, we have to be careful that we, when, when we talk to one another, certainly as a church, we say, uh, I hope you get well soon or something like that. And we say, anything I can do, you just let me know. And then what happens? It goes silent. And then nothing. And I have to say this, sometimes I think people are scared. They say it and they go, oh, I really hope they don't ask me to do anything. I really hope they don't ask me to do anything. Maybe that used to be me. But that alone, I think, is, is a, an example of genuine trust. It's, it's not just words. Um, it's let me know what I can do and then actually doing it with action, showing that you love that person and then making it known outwardly to them. Uh, and this is the effect of what comes from a love for friends and family uh, instead of just words uh, are then effect of, of nothing. Uh, but there is a problem with this example in the comparison to genuine faith. We do seem to struggle with the expectation of reciprocal actions. Uh, and you may have people you know or have known where either, uh, where either spoken or unspoken, some of your relationships can become transactional. And I've had this in my life where there's an expectation, if I do something for you, you do something for me. Sometimes it is unspoken, but when you don't do something for that person, uh, they will surely bring it up. And when the going gets tough and the relationship between family or friends becomes dicey, sometimes people will use what they've done for someone against them. 
and they'll create this list in their mind of all the good things they've done and how can you treat me this way and how can you not do something for me when I've done all these things for you. And you can only imagine how long this list of good things is that I've done for this church. And if we fall out, I'll be pulling out that list and saying, look what I've done for you. Not really, of course, I don't hold a list, I'm just joking. Uh, of course, I'm not going to hold anything against anyone here. And I'm not going to use that to say, just because I'm doing stuff in church and for church, actually, my attitude, as we all should be, is it's not about me. It's not about what I do and what I contribute or not contribute. It's actually about I do it for Jesus. What's, why am I here? I'm not driven primarily by the church, by us even gathering together. First and foremost, I understand the love Jesus has for me. And out of that love, I want to do some good things, not to impress Jesus, just to thank him for what he's done. And so I don't just show it in words. I don't just read my Bible and then say, well, I've read my Bible today. I've done my two pages or whatever, and then I'm done here today. No, I actually want to find or seek opportunity to serve. Sometimes, actually, that's very automatic, and we don't always need to seek it. But the problem is, is that the relationship is always, uh, when it's built on transactional relationships, uh, uh, you do something for me and I'll do something for you. Um, this can be the cause of, of an unhealthy relationship uh, between people. Uh, one that is either uh, healthy, uh, that expects nothing in return, um, or an unhealthy one that's always looking to balance the books through the currency of favours. Um, and you see, just in these examples, we have this intention and motive. What is our motive for our friendships, for our relationships with other people? Uh, are we looking to leverage friendships and relationships? Maybe we don't realise we are doing it, and sometimes we leverage that because actually we want something uh, from them, something we want them to do for us. But let's see how this works in the Christian faith and understand how should Christians see this non-transactional relationship that's uh, healthy and good uh, for us. Uh, James 2, as we start our uh, verses 14 to 17. What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. Uh, if one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, uh, what good is it in the same way faith by itself if it is not accompanied by action is dead i think as, as human beings our actions uh, are normally driven by what we believe to be right and true and unfortunately as we've seen recently uh, for some it tends not to matter if these beliefs uh, and truths, as it were, are actually right and true in themselves. Uh, Jeremiah 17 to, uh, 9 to 10 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart, examine the mind to reward a man according to his conduct, according to what his deeds deserve. Uh, we find this again in Luke 6, 44 to 46. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes uh, from briars. Uh, the good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For out of the overflow of his heart, his mouth speaks. At a basic level, uh, faith in Jesus should change our hearts. It, it should do something to how we behave. And not just on the outside, it should change every decision and how we make that decision every single day of our lives. Uh, and, and this is very difficult because we make m minor decisions every day in every way in our lives. But we're told to keep God at the center of our faith every day. And I, I can't dress this up any other way other than to say, as a Christian, it should impact you with small decisions that you make in your life. Uh, and I'm going to tell you the truth, it is a struggle. It's a struggle to keep including God in even the small decisions uh, as you walk through in life, especially 
when those things involve pain and hurt, when you have to make choices that are trying to maybe even rectify a situation, but maybe we rush to the solution before we consult God. Maybe we trust in ourselves a bit too much when we try to do that. But in this warning from James, he effectively says that those who do not put their faith into action speaks of a heart that, conversely, is full of emptiness. There's nothing in it. The faith that this person professes to have, if not followed up by visible fruit, as we've seen in the verses, visible actions of some degree or another, is really dead. And I've said this uh, in the last few weeks as we've been looking through James. James does not call punches here. Uh, he is very direct about how we should be as Christians, how we should show certainly other people Jesus' love for them. And, and, and sometimes in our messed up lives, that's very difficult to do. So when James references this example of helping someone, he uh, says this, um, James 2, 15 to 16, suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. Uh, if one of you says to him, go and go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? He says, in effect, that this person or this person's speech from their mouth or lips and lack of action reveals what is truly in their heart, which is a faith that is dead. And that let's just consider something here. We need to be careful about what James is saying about deeds. Just because he uses the example of providing something for someone who is in a physical need does not mean that deeds are narrowly defined by helping those who need clothes and daily food. James is really using this example, and I'll get onto this, in his context at that very moment of what's going on in his life as he lives for his brother, his half-brother Jesus, and he is using the example to, to show if we don't do something from the faith we profess to believe in, what is it really worth? Deeds, ultimately, are the outward actions of the faith we have in Jesus. Just as it is helpful to help with practical needs, our faith should also spur us into action when we see brothers and sisters in Christ who are spiritually struggling. It might even be someone who doesn't believe in God and is struggling with something also. What can we do for the more complex need? Well, I'm going to give you the first principle. And probably, if you don't do anything else, this is what we need to do. It's prayer. That might sound like a get out of jail card. It might sound like a, a way of me just kind of batting away the problem. But as I said earlier, the problem that we face as people, as Christians most certainly, is that we sometimes rush into decisions. We rush into choices. And here, we should first pray. First come to God. Offer it to him and say, Lord, will you guide me in this situation? I want to help, but what is the good way and healthy way I can help without me stepping in and just blurting out some Christian thing that every Christian says and then walk away and say, well, job done, I'm off now. I've done a good job for God today. Prayer is so incredibly important. And the reason why this is important is because James also says it in verses and chapters later on, which we'll also get onto later in the series. But a little preview now. James 5.16 says, therefore confess your sins to each other, pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. So we need to be careful, and I've heard this, the, uh, uh, the verses in James 2 used to justify some sort of that's how it works. We just go and feed people, we just go and clothe them, we just want to help their physical need because that's what Christians should do. Actually, the first thing we should be concerned about is their salvation. Uh, we want people to come to know Jesus. And then in order to do that, we of course need to ask Jesus and say, Lord, how can I help this person whole, in whole, physical, spiritually, 
and practically. Now, deeds, as we see them here in James, are not measured by how extravagant they are. Okay? So, again, what it's trying to do is so that you don't, we don't, I don't boast in the good things that I might do for God. And, here, and what James does carefully here is he use an example. He, he's trying to say that it's not, it's not even about the, how great the, the gesture is, how great the thing is that you've done. Deeds are simply those things we do because we first have faith in Jesus and want to do what he also did. What are those things? What are those things that are maybe not giving clothes or, or, or giving food to somebody? It can simply be a listening ear, simply sitting down and listening to somebody. And it can be right up to giving a homeless person a house to live in, of course. But deeds are deeds, no matter the surface appearance of them. What matters is why we do them. Do I do them for my glory? Do I do them because I want to be recognized as a very good Christian? Or do I do them because I want to glorify God and see that person ultimately, maybe not even in that moment, but know the love of Jesus uh, that Jesus has for them? What matters is why we do them, the intent and that we dedicate ourselves to that person's need. Jesus went from washing the disciples' feet to feeding the 5,000. They're all deeds, they're all good things that, that done not to show that we can do some good works, but to show his love as he showed love to them, to his disciples who argued, who debated with him sometimes who even didn't want him to go to the cross. But the reason why deeds uh, have to meet the need is because in James's time, and the environment he was in, many around him were in bitter poverty. They actually were suffering, and, and in some places now today in the world, it is not far different. But in James's time, most certainly, and his very immediate environment, we find that there was bitter poverty and was rampant everywhere. Uh, they were considered the poorest of the poor. Uh, there were people who, who could not be, sadly, beaten in being the poorest in the world. And this was a challenge of the context that James was in. So then, what do deeds look like in the wider context? Well, let's have a look at uh, Philippians 2, verses 1 to 4. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, uh, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Uh, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Uh, each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. You see the, the overriding principle here is that we, as Christians most certainly, those who believe in Jesus and are saved, if, our, if we believe in the assurance of Christ, hey, look, to some degree, we're there. Jesus has got us. So what have we got to lose by showing that same love to others? No need to focus on my needs anymore. My needs are met eternally. I might have needs in the physical moment, in the physical time that we're on earth here, but actually, I'm assured you know, we're going to enter heaven with Jesus Christ and spend eternity with him. And when we think of that, then we think of the people that we meet and we talk to. It's like, wow, I, I wish you knew Jesus. I wish you knew Jesus. How does belief in God reveal then, uh, reveal itself in the world? Uh, John 13, verse 35. I've gone too far, haven't I? Oh. I think I've jumped one. One second. You only think I might be missing something here. Yeah, give me a second. Wow. Yes, thank you, Dan. Was it in the wrong order? Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. John thirteen thirty-five says this. Uh, by this, everyone will know 
but you will make disciples uh, if you love one another. Uh, it is simply not possible uh, to have... Ooh, just give me a second here, guys, because I think I've skipped an entire section of my sermon, which doesn't make any sense, and I want it to make sense. Um, I'm, I'm going to go back. Bear with me, guys. Bear with me. We're, we're nearly there. Yeah, this is the one. All right. So it's 2, 1 to 4. And, oh, this, the iPad is skipping on me. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, and it's core. This is it. The act of deeds towards others out of faith in Jesus is one that will be sacrificial. And so faith and deeds cannot be separated. They are integral part of one another. This is the right verse now, James 2, 18 to 19. But someone will say, you have faith and I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds and I will show you my faith by what I do. At 19, you believe that there is one God. Good. Even demons believe that and shudder. Right here, it is understood that someone is trying to say that faith in God is separate from the deeds we do. But James says, when you, when you only believe something to be true, that there is one God, it's no different to that of what the demons believe. The demons believe there is God. The difference is, do you believe in God in order that it changes you, and so do the work that God has set forward for you. This is the difference between a dead faith and a saving faith. Uh, we have many that will go to church for the simple idea that going to church is all that is needed to be saved. Uh, and by the way, I think that's our fault as churches. Now, I don't want to blame the people that are walking through the doors because actually uh, church should know better uh, than that. They are guided by the word. And so should not be giving the sense that if you turn up to church, that alone will save you. You could never turn up to church and you can still be saved. The difference with church and the role of church is you come into a community of believers and they support and they help you. We know that people struggle with this idea. We know that churches uh, do maybe subconsciously push this idea that if you just turn up to church, you'll be okay. Uh, because even non-believers go to church. Even people who don't believe in God like going to church. I know a few people that go to different churches uh, and have no, no beginning of wanting to come and believe in God. So it's not that you turn up, it's not the doing of itself that's going to do anything to save us. But what makes, say, Christians different uh, from being a churchgoer? Well, church might have helped many come to know Jesus. Mainly, that's the purpose of church, is to share the gospel, and so that they may know Jesus and come and be saved. But church is not the reason you trust in God. Because here's what happens when you say, I trust in God based on the interaction and the relationship I have with people here. Guess what, people? We're all sinners and we're all flawed and we all need Jesus. Basing God on who we are is not a healthy relationship to have with God. We're all here because we recognize that Jesus is Lord and we want those to see that also. Church is the conduit by which you're introduced to God. Then as you learn to trust this God through your own engagement, you need help and support from other Christians to take that journey. This is what is called the body of believers. It's the point where we recognize we're all in the same boat. And you know what? I have bad days. You have bad days. I have good days and you have good days. But we don't hide those things, right? We don't pretend that because we now believe in God that suddenly everything's fixed. In fact, what I always say is, once you come to believe in Jesus, your eyes are opened. That's what the Bible says. You see the world for what it is, the, the flaws, the evilness, the sin. 
wow, why did you save a sinner like me? Church is the place we learn and live out our faith towards others. Not that we attend for the sake of a good attendance record that you think will impress God. What should drive our desire to come to church is that you want the body of Christ, fellow believers, to be built up and encouraged in their faith, in our faith. Not attend a church that simply works for you. Remember this, uh, Philippians 2 verse 4, each of you should look not only to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. And so then, how does belief in God reveal itself then in the world? How does it play out? How does it show itself? John thirteen thirty five. by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. It is simply not possible to have a faith without deeds and call it a saving faith. If it saves us, it changes us. And when it changes us, it takes the focus of, off of us and onto Jesus and reminds us of the ultimate sacrificial act of Christ's death on the cross for the sins of mankind. So therefore, I want others to know this Jesus. How? By word and by deed. By what I believe and what I believe those actions tell me to do, those words tell me to do. But not word without deed or deed without word. And so then uh, James bluntly uh, continues, you foolish man, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. Verse 23, and the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. Uh, in the same one was not even Rahab, the prostitute, considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. Uh, as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. This is probably a good place just to talk about the cause of faith. Um, these verses can commonly be misunderstood uh, and they've normally, not normally, but sometimes people say that these verses contradict what Paul says about what works are. Uh, Paul says, on the surface, I'll give you a generalisation because that's how people do it when they don't see what the, the text is actually saying. They say, why does Paul say that it is faith? It has to be faith. You can't do it by deeds. You can't do it by works. And James says, you must do it by works in order to show your faith. There's a very easy misunderstanding of what's gone on here. What we've been looking at as we look through James here is the effect of faith. What James is not saying, as we've been working through, is that deeds or work in themselves actually save you. In this sense, he's not contradicting what Paul says about deeds and works. And we find this in Ephesians 2, 8 to 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. You understand where works has its placement. Works does not have its placement in the earning of salvation. Jesus has done that already. And what Jesus calls us to do is say, you can just accept this amazing gift of salvation and grace. What James says is that if that be in the case, would it not show that you had this faith by the actions that you then take? He says very, we have to be very careful because there's a lot of people who confuse these texts and, and call them contradictory when they're not. Paul is talking about the cause of faith. It is not that you earned your salvation by doing works or deed. It is that firstly, you've been saved by the salvation and grace provided for you by Jesus Christ. James here then continues that principle, that therefore, if you truly believe in Jesus and you've allowed him to change you and continue to change your character, and work on your heart through the Holy Spirit, then you will respond to that gift of salvation 
by wanting to see other people know God through the deeds that we then want to do because of this amazing salvation. Faith, James says, is made complete by what we do with the trust we now have in God. So we have cause of faith, which is provided by Jesus, so we can believe in who he is, but then we have the effect of faith, so we can do what we claim we believe in. Uh, many of you will know I'm a big fan of Charles Spurgeon, and thank you for rightly pointing out, for those that don't know who Charles Spurgeon is, he was a great preacher, a great teacher, uh, in many, many moons ago, uh, but said his, his quotes, as it were, let me say that, because we put them into quotes, but his sermons were amazing. Uh, some things, by the way, healthily disagree with about what he believed about uh, how God chooses or not chooses or whatever uh, we want to may not go into now but here is a, a very good quote uh, as i think every quote i brought up uh, seems to to be <laughs> helpful faith and works are bound up in the same bundle he that obeys god trusts god and he that trusts god obeys god he that is without faith is without works and he that is without works is without faith and then you kind of just need some time just to process what he's saying there uh, there's a lot of going backwards and forwards, but he's, Charles Spurgeon is making the, the claim or the principle as the Bible does, it's circular. You can't, it's all in one, you can't separate them at all. Uh, I don't know if you've heard the saying, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. This is a very old saying, isn't it? Uh, and I don't know if you remember a TV program called Vicar of Dibley. Uh, there was this character in, this, in the show called uh, Letitia Cropley, Miss Cropley. Uh, and she used to bake many cakes uh, that looked, looked uh, appetizing and delicious. Uh, but the eating soon found them out. She would wait until you took a bite in the cake and then tell you what was in them. Uh, and some of those cakes are bread and butter pudding surprise. Uh, it was a recipe for breeding snails. Uh, a Marmite cake, if there's such a thing. Orange cake with Branston pickle as icing. Parsnip brownies, uh, plain pancakes with just a hint of liver. And chocolate spread sandwiches made with taramasalata. I suppose this is, I think this is a good example of, in a more serious way, of thinking about what we claim to be and who we really are. James is challenging us to, the, to that very point. When we, when we think about faith in Jesus and tell others about that, how will they have evidence of not only us believing in what Jesus said, but how it has changed our life and continues to change our lives today? True faith changes you and continues to change you. Yet ultimately, while it's good uh, to have a genuine faith so that others may see the work of that faith, it, I think there is a much more important reason. We must not allow ourselves to be deceived into thinking that simply believing there is a God is enough. It must be followed with putting our trust in Jesus, the only way by which anyone can be saved and so know what it means to be truly saved. The fruit of our faith is shown by our obedience to God's word, to live out that which we profess to believe in. That is where faith and action work together. And in doing so, our faith will be made complete. So here it is. We, we must keep in view the principle that we do not have this transactional relationship with God. This, this is an amazing gift from God. The only thing God is asking us to do is trust in him. And you don't get to heaven because you're good at something or you do some good works and people are impressed by how good you are. Jesus gives that to you as a son and daughter of his because that's what he did, not because of what we did. And it's simply first an acceptance of Jesus who is Lord and then to trust your life, put your life in his hands. We do not get salvation because we did something first to earn it. God was the one who provided the way for an undeserving people 
to be saved by sending his obedient son to die on the cross. Jesus then, out of complete obedience and love for the Father, gave his life for mankind. God the Father and God the Son as persons worked to one goal, to serve the Godhead as God, to glorify the one who deserved all the credit. Ephesians 2, verse 4 to 6. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions, that's in sin. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. We don't do the work of disciples of Jesus because we have to. We do it because we want to. To show our gratitude and our love for a holy God who wants all to be saved. We're going to have some time of worship now. Uh, and then in between our songs, you haven't made, been here before, uh, we have a time of prayer. Uh, and that will come up on the screen. And you can freely pray. You can pray in your head. You can pray out loud. Uh, but we come here in this moment then to uh, build each other up in the church as God Jesus Christ himself has told us to do build and edify one another in Christ uh, so I'm going to pray uh, and then we'll have uh, a, a worship time together